Welcome students to this lecture on traditional Dedina technology, housing, clothing, and other manufacturers. I'm Alan Boris, and I'm speaking to you from my office here at Kenai Peninsula College. So we will have this lecture on, on technology and a related lecture uh, as a separate lecture on subsistence. Technology, of course, is the way that one way that humans adapt, and uh, we gain great insight uh, in understanding technology in the adaptation process. So we'll talk first about housing. Um, we've covered this before. So uh, when we talked about uh, Denina prehistory and Denina archaeology, we talked about sedentary villages, the Avunki local villages, and we talked about that when we talked about uh, social structure. So this is sort of a review. Uh, the Nina villages would be 4 to 15, not exactly, but approximately 4 to 15 houses. They tend to be located on higher ground, above a river or a lake, and they're not in close little compounds. They tend to be separated by 50 to 200 meters apart. Now this varies. This is sort of the, this is typical of the Kenai Peninsula. At a place like Kijik, for example, they are a little clo more closely separated, although it's not entirely clear that all of those houses were occupied at the same time. So there might, there certainly were multiple villages. Same with the upper inlet. But that tends to be the pattern. Uh, seldom, uh, although that's not always the case as well, but seldom are the villages right by water, right by a river, right by a creek, or right by a lake. They usually are on upper ground, uh, higher ground, on a ridge overlooking that lake. Why is not entirely clear. They, um, I know one, uh, should we say possible reason, logical reason, uh, is temperature. So temperature can, if it's, uh, I, I, uh, will rise according to elevation, particularly in winter. Uh, for a year I drove uh, 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 keep recording the high and low temperatures from where I live in Kasilov to where I work at the college on the Kenai River about 12 mile drive and uh, inevitably there could be as different as much of a difference between the very coldest areas say 15 below and it might be 5 above and the upper reaches with not a great deal of elevation gain so uh, temperature might be one thing you want to live in the warmer areas but also it could simply be choice um, uh, choice, for example, if we compare Anchorage, the hillside, with uh, Rio de Janeiro. In Rio, uh, the wealthier homes are in the lowland areas and the very poor people live up on the, on the highland areas. In the Anchorage hillside area, the tend to be wealthy homes up above and, and, and not so wealthy uh, homes down below, although the coastal belt uh, changes that. So cultural preference could be part of it. Um, people learn to live and appreciate uh, places uh, that they were taught to live to appreciate. So these houses are called nichilsh, um, permanent multi-room log structures, uh, usually about 20 by 25 feet and always with a gabled roof. Uh, that size can vary. There are some of them are fairly small, others larger. And nearby in that village there would be underground cold storage pits and we'll get to those in a moment. So in the upper right here is a drawing by um, uh, Brandy Curley who works here in the anthropology lab, a redrawing of a drawing I did. So hers is much better. And this is a model of a Nichilsh at the Quebec, Quebec, Quebec Visitor Center. Um, which is across from the uh, uh, Russian River campground on the Kenai Peninsula. So if you're from Anchorage or the Valley, and you, or for that matter from the Kenai Peninsula, but if you're traveling down and you pass that, you might stop in, you will see that model and they will take you a tour of a site. It's, uh, it's very nice. So uh, this is 
Osgood's description of the structure. These were not notched logs, even though it appeared to be a log structure. Uh, Pre-contact wise, there weren't axes uh, like the uh, steel axes that would have been capable of notching logs, so they would sink poles in the corner and um, and these these poles would refer to these poles would refer to these poles here so uh, that would be uh, they'd be sunk in the ground and then tied off in this area right here and pardon that uh, pardon the break I had to get my little draw or pointer um, working here and that's these poles right here and uh, then tied off uh, every, every course of logs and then so this would pinch together and they'd pry open this and put in another course of logs and there'd be another set here of course and they would work their way up and um, in so doing uh, have a stout structure once the logs were put up, uh, Osgood describes a kind of shingling effect. So they would take rye grass, which is a common grass, not just on the beach, but sometimes in interior areas. It's kind of a coarse grass. And lay a layer around, and then another layer around, and so on, uh, shingling the outside, and that would protect it from water, wind, and other things. And undoubtedly, they were chinked on the inside. Someday it'd be nice to build an exact model of one of these, and I'm sure that will happen one day, but uh, very efficient log structures that would have blended nicely with the landscape. Here is a, a um, drawing of one, a pen and ink version of one, uh, by a man named Elliot who was here in the late 1800s, and his publication came out in, the, in 1906, and he he sort of calls this the bedroom annex of a Canitesi rancherie, and he probably was from California because often the native um, houses were called rancheries in California. And this is the only known uh, pen and ink drawing of a uh, Nichilsh as it may have existed uh, in the late 1800s. And by that time they were probably shifting to notching logs on the corners. Nichilsh. There also were temporary fish camps built similarly at the mouth of a salmon stream if the village itself wasn't on a salmon stream and these would be occupied by that same Avunki local group and uh, people would sleep inside where they also smoked the fish, cold smoking fish and that was said to keep the mosquitoes at bay, the smoke, and uh, these were temporary or at least used only in the summer um, and these are temporary fish camps. Around the uh, village or near the village would be Essenen To. These are the underground cold storage pits and we talked about the significance of those when we talked about uh, the appearance of the sedentary Denina at 1000 AD. So again it was a pit in the ground lined with birch bark and moss and birch bark and then a layer of fish, a layer of grass, a layer of fish, a layer of grass all the time letting it freeze each night and that became then covered with uh, more moss and birch bark creating this thermal unit and this uh, was a uh, key to Denina adaptation to um, the Cook Inlet and the Mulchatna and the Quijic drainages. Another structure would be a temporary brush camp. These uh, would be uh, short-term shelters, um, sort of a pole and branch lean-to type thing. As far as I know, uh, built by all peoples in the wooded north, uh, your standard lean-to. It'd be typically to be occupied by a single man or maybe partners, seldom partners, out uh, trapping in the winter. Uh, or small hunting parties, um, or um, whole villages, Not a, they would, would each build their own, each family or each couple of people would build their own and uh, while they were traveling. So it was quick and easy. Uh, later we'll talk about sheepskin uh, sleeping bags which you would travel with but you wouldn't br bring a tent. 
you would uh, build one of these and uh, then you'd move on and and uh, just sort of let it go. I've built these, uh, slept in them. They're pretty pretty comfy. Uh, you have to build them so that the uh, the wind is this way um, parallel to the opening. If you build it so the wind comes this way, of course the smoke comes in on you and if you build it where with the, your back to the wind then the draft will take the smoke into you. So if you want to try one of these, build it in such a way that your your opening is parallel to the to the uh, prevailing wind if you can tell what it is. Your standard Boy Scout um, lean-to um, and uh, a, a brush camp, referred to as a brush camp. Another was a temporary beaver house and I don't have any illustrations of that. This would be typically built by a group of men hunting in the fall up in the mountains. So uh, it would occur where you'd have an alder patch. So here I'm going to try to try to draw an uh, alder patch. These are alders. We've got a lot of alders here. These are all, you know, with those thick, dense alder patches. If you've climbed in the mountains, you know how much you want to avoid those because they're wicked hard to get through. So let's see if I can. So there's your alder patch. I have to go to my pen here and get my eraser. And what they would do is clear out in the center, maybe a 10 by 10 area. They would clear out the alders. OK, not too bad, Alan. And then what they would do is so I'm going to go down. This is this is from the top down here and from a cross section if this is the ground they would and this is the cleared part right here they would bend outside trees over like so like so Let's see if I can fill this in here this is looking from a hat whoop I didn't do that one very well we'll go back to the eraser here eraser this is and pen and bend these over time off so that you would have this little shelter and then use the ones you cut out from the middle to cover over the top and layer them in such a way that the wind and the water would the water particularly would shed off and I don't know if they had they probably had a smoke hole or something in the middle and built a fire inside so the same idea they would travel light uh, not carrying a tent, not carrying any any skins or anything like that. Build these kind of shelters up in the mountains. When they're done, untie it. And uh, I've watched alder grow back. They they'll grow back in a year or two, and maybe even would they go back and they would go back in the next year or so. So those are temporary beaver houses. Uh, quite a bit has been written in various cultures about the way the uh, dwellings match the landscape and in all of these cases you would have uh, dwellings matching not being invasive too but matching the landscape. Transportation then in summer um, we'll talk about three main types of transportation four really so one would be walking jogging on well-established trails um, this um, was more common I think in later times but there were earlier trails as well um, and the level of fitness is to be uh, admired here Peter Kalifornsky for example told me that it was common for for them at Kalifornsky village when it was still occupied about 12 miles from Kenai to jog in on the beach for a night on the town and they'd have a night on a town and late at night or early the next morning jog back home everybody every to jog 12 miles was no big thing uh, Herman Hermanson and Herman Lindgren tell the story of uh, working cutting wood in the Skelac Lake area and jogging 30 miles into Kenai for the dances on that were held on Saturday night they jog in on snowshoes 
after working all day, take a sweat bath, and put on their good clothes and dance probably all night. Next morning, get up, go to church, uh, and put on their work clothes, jog back to be 30 miles to Ski Lack Lake area to be ready to go again Monday morning to work cutting wood. Very fit people. Whole villages would travel. Men, women, children. Uh, and these established trails um, uh, would be part of that. I should add that many of those were winter trails and we'll talk about that next uh, as far as using snowshoes. Mostly in the summer, however, uh, the the rivers and lakes were used because of the marshy conditions and uh, of the hinterland uh, and the dense forest. Uh, uh, the summer transportation was primarily water transportation. So birch bark canoes were used. Here's a picture from Osgood's book, which you have in your packet of a birch bark canoe. Since birch bark grows more in northern areas, uh, this would be more typical of, say, from Nanilchik north and uh, probably more in the Tyonic area north and so on. But there's plenty of birch bark around, and this is your standard northern birch bark canoe. This is a Denina style. A second type of transportation was this moosehide boat. And here, Peter Kalifornsky's father and uncle are in one of those moosehide boats. Uh, we haven't been able to find, or I haven't been able to figure out exactly where this was. It looks like it's on a lake. Thought initially it was Tustamina, but it's not Tustamina. I went up trying to match the photo with the with the with the place, um, but I haven't quite succeeded yet. So the Mooseide boat was a fall uh, temporary boat. It wasn't meant to be the permanent boat that the canoe was, or the Bikudini, the kayak was. Uh, down here. It was a temporary boat. You'd go up, you'd hunt a moose, probably caribou at one time, and the hide of the killed moose became the out the skin of the boat. And then you would put the meat and and all into the boat and go back downstream. So these were mainly downstream boats. They were they were not as uh, sleek and uh, easy to maneuver as birch bark or, or certainly the kayaks. And so this is a picture from Peter Kalifornsky's book, which you also have um, in your in your packet. And the third type of watercraft was a kayak, also called a badarka. The Denina term was bikudini, bikudini, and this was used mainly in salt water, uh, almost certainly borrowed from Alutig peoples, uh, typical salt water type of craft. Um, the Denina didn't use a double-bladed kayak, they used a single-bladed kayak. And here you see this photograph from the Gompertz collection. Kate Gompertz was the wife of a cannery manager in Kenai in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this photo is almost certainly taken right off the beach in Kenai. And there you see that typical prow and the men have a single-bladed um, paddle here. Three types of transportation in the summer, uh, and four if you count uh, traveling on trails. Winter travel uh, changed the picture. Now the swamps are covered, uh, frozen, the rivers are frozen, and the main winter transportation were snowshoes. Several styles, uh, a wet snow snowshoe with a more open weave, a dry snow snowshoe with a closed weave. This uh, is a dry snow dry weave here. Uh, and so you would have different types of snowshoes according to different snow conditions. The idea, of course, is that the snow drops through the weave. And if it's wet snow, it clumps up. And you want a more open weave. And if it's dry, you, uh, you want a more closed weave to give yourself flotation. They also used bear claws as foot fangs. Some of you maybe uh, have uh, modern um, snowshoes with that little claw-like thing under the foot. Very handy. And the Denina had a way of concocting something like that out of bear claws because icy conditions very difficult to snowshoe. 
This snowshoe, uh, modeled by Trish, uh, was made by Patrick Monroney uh, for a class, the same class. It was his project. He researched the design in uh, Osgood's book and others, and he got the birch. He bent the birch uh, slowly uh, and uh, cross pieces. And the web was actual sinew that he got from Roadkill Moose, the back strap of the moose. And he made this snowshoe as a model. And I've shown it to a number of Denina, including Andrew Baluda, a Denina elder, and he looked at it and sort of said, pretty good, <laughs> pretty good. He did note one ple place here, I don't remember where it is, where he said, oh, he, he made a mistake here, but that's okay. That's, you know, that, that's, that's really good. Uh, Patrick was a pretty big guy. Uh, he he went over 200 pounds, I'd say, and uh, he said, "I'll show you how 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 strong this is." So he put it between two chairs, and he so that you know one chair would be up here and one chair down here, and he stood on it. And I'm, I know, I'm no, don't stand on it, but it held him. And the reason is. The web hold, it takes the weight. It's not the wood that takes the weight, it's the webbing that holds the weight. And uh, uh, so it was, it was a great job. Uh, for his project, he said he was going to make a pair of snowshoes, but he only made one, so I had to give him a B. And I hope you don't take that seriously. It was, <laughs> it was, a, it was, a, perfect, it was a great job. So winter travel then, uh, small dog teams were commonly used, particularly by people out trapping. Uh, three, four dogs, small teams, not, uh, not large teams. There's a kind of a, a economy of scale. The more dogs you have, the more food. And if you're just out traveling, uh, one, one or two people, small dog teams are uh, are what you'd want to have because you have to feed those dogs and in earlier times that is before uh, European contact uh, without axes and saws it was harder to make trails we don't have the same sort of natural trails like the Yukon River or any of the rivers up north that are wide and frozen for the most part the Kenai River, for example, typically breaks up. The Susitna River breaks up. Um, places like the Chewitna River break up at times, so that you can't count on them for large dog team travel. So it was more typical to use these small dog teams. But with uh, the ability to make trails uh, and that sort of cost-benefit ratio with canneries coming in, so probably more access to dog food, um, these large dog teams began to appear and also mail and goods from trading posts. So this is a picture of a dog team that was used uh, in the Seward area to bring goods over to Kenai and um, big dogs and strong dogs, not fast dogs. These aren't, these aren't going to win the Iditarod race but they're going to do very well in cold harsh conditions. So that appears uh, later time. So we'll move to clothing. The basic garment was a tanned uh, caribou hide belted tunic. This one doesn't have the belt, uh, which reached to just above the knee for men and below the knee for women. So the one pictured to the right is a picture from Osgood's book, and it would be a, a, a woman's tunic. Uh, usually pointed in the front and back, and not always, but usually, and fringed. Uh, the fringes across the chest area and on the bottom. Uh, fringes, I've read and been told numerous times, function to wick water away. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like a good story. The dress version would have been very elaborate uh, and uh, decorated with quills, and I'll show you that, and or dentalium shells, tanned to this sort of off-white. And I've seen uh, in back rooms of museums, I've seen uh, these uh, garments, and they're just absolutely beautiful and very soft and very supple and just uh, amazing garments. Um, uh, not not 
you know, leathery, creaky, hard, but soft, uh, supple garments. Men wear the tanned uh, skin pull-on pants underneath, but the women only the tunic, and of course it's longer. Here's some more pictures. Uh, this is a this is a tunic that uh, has the different style quill work uh, beadwork. Pardon me at the top, the fringing, uh, beautiful colors. Another one here, lower right, different colors. It's possible that the colors reflect clan identity, but nobody's quite figured that out yet. Possibly the beadwork pattern reflects clan identity. This one in the upper right is a woman's um, Denina garment in the Anchorage Museum, and uh, that is, I believe, on display. And there's her uh, cap, which draped down uh, over the back. Men didn't wear this type of cap, but women women did. The tanning was probably brain tanning uh, as the main agent. Uh, they could tan with the hair on, the hair off. They were experts at doing this type of work. Brains provides the right amount and type of acid that helps break down the stiffness without breaking down the garment uh, too much. Boots then were knee length, uh, tied off at the top and probably also tied off with a uh, right here. Uh, and those were decorated as well, those ties. Um, caribou could be sheep. Um, and if the hair on would be very warm. The soles were brown bear or um, beluga skin. And this would be the sole, of course, this part sewed on here. So you could unsew it and replace the sole and this part of the garment of course is still good as you wore out the sole. Brown bear and beluga are both very tough skins so they're not going to wear out very fast. They were greased with porcupine grease for water repellency so the porcupine is boiled in water and you skim off the grease that rises to the top and that becomes the water not waterproofing agent, but the water resistant agent. You want the boots to breathe. You don't, we want them to repel water, but not be totally waterproof because then you have problems with your feet uh, sweating and uh, potentially uh, trench foot. Uh, often trimmed with marten, lynx, or beaver. Uh, interestingly, the poor were said to trim their boots with mink. <laughs> sort of the opposite, we have that standard where mink is the high class fur and with Denina was the low class fur. Old men and children usually went barefoot unless traveling uh, as did men when running down game and that's sort of a curious thing um, how you know going barefoot seems uh, like that's a pretty harsh thing to do. I was once in a 10k running race and uh, uh, this was in Oregon, and it was on pavement, but there were a lot of gravelly little stones, and some of you have been in 10K races, especially when you're back in the pack, as I always am. And, you know, you're kind of running along, and it settles down after a few kilometers, whop, 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 and everybody around you is doing the same whop, whop, whop at the same pace. And and here, I don't know, three, four kilometers in, the guy comes by, whap, 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 and look down, he's barefoot. And he, of course, attracted quite a crowd at the end. And the calluses on his feet were, I don't know, I didn't, <laughs> didn't touch him, tell you the truth. <laughs> but they were a good quarter, quarter of an inch, maybe more. Very tough. And he just didn't like wearing shoes. And, and I don't know what he did for a living, but he didn't wear shoes. So... Um, he was able to to run in that kind of condition and this probably would have been typical of most people in Denina territory pre-contact wise uh, building up the toughness and that's also a good thing because um, it uh, it means that you have a kind of resistance to any kind of foot problems that might occur so winter clothing then, uh, the same tunic and pants as the summer. So you wear the same summer gear, but over that you had a belted, a hooded fur parka, anorak style, or a coat that wasn't, didn't have the, um, the, 
that wasn't an anorak style coat and that was would reach just below the knee for men uh, or ankles for the women so these long coats caribou uh, tanned with the fur on the outside ties at the wrist and hood and the sheepskin parkas were known but they were rare uh, too hot so you you know there's a there's that right balance of having enough insulation so you're comfortable but not too hot so you sweat and that defeats the purpose I don't have any pictures of that but this one is probably the hunter's garment uh, active hunters used a waist waist length parka made of caribou tanned with the fur on the outside well this one doesn't have the fur on the outside but it's a uh, sort of that smaller parka this illustration is from Osgood they would carry it while they were traveling because they're snowshoeing they're exerting those of you who are snowshoers or skiers know that you can't have all your insulation on or you're just going to sweat too much and defeat the purpose but you put it on when you're in camp you put your coat on when in camp uh, rich men occasionally have parkas made of eagle or loon skin it took about 20 skins um, and the feathers are plucked but the down is left on and those examples that are in museums are just remarkable they're just amazing and very warm and uh, very beautiful but I'm sure it took more effort to make than the average parka winter clothing in addition to the parka were winter overpants so these would be pulled on over the over the regular pants with the footy here this sort of jammy like footy uh, sewn in and that becomes your uh, winter garment sort of like over pants that skiers will sometimes wear and this would be lined with grass or rabbit fur uh, grass is a very good insulator uh, and of course once it gets wet you simply toss it out and put in dry grass sort of like some of you may have Sorel uh, type boots and you know once the liner gets wet it's pretty much useless so you if it's really cold you carry a second liner rabbit fur also extremely warm same thing they probably wouldn't have thrown it away but they would have exchanged dry rabbit fur when they're traveling or working in cold weather easily as functional as any modern um, winter gear that we have today I would say um, it's a real trick working outside in winter for eight hours a day or longer well into the night and uh, the idea is to be able to manage your clothing know how much to wear know how much when to take it off when to put it on having the right gear there's an old Swedish saying that says there's no bad weather only bad gear if you got the right gear know how to use it and you'll do okay I wouldn't be surprised if there's something like that in every northern people's vocabulary no bad weather only bad gear so this is some of the winter clothing that would have made active outdoor work possible in the winter for the Denina the quill work and bead work is very interesting this uh, illustration in the upper left is quill work uh, it was uh, if you can see this but it was built on a on a panel and that panel then sewn into the garment so it could be removed exchanged uh, whatever it wasn't the quills weren't sewn directly onto the garment but onto this this panel and the quills are flattened and processed and dyed and the technique of sewing is this over under type thing the dye would be either that uh, red clay stone ground up or possibly alder you know, you know if you've cut alder and peel off the bark it turns that reddish um, reddish kind of rust hue which is a very beautiful color it's used by a lot of people in the north the Sami in particular use that color for a lot of coloring and the black I don't know charcoal some version of charcoal and this is probably the natural color right here so porcupine uh, quill work is very beautiful uh, but gave way to uh, beadwork and beads were highly desi desirable in the early trade uh, to create patterns like this and then uh, patterns like this so the early quill work was geometric in style 
and that style then carried over into beadwork geometric forms like is like right in here but eventually the beadwork went from geometric forms to these floral patterns and these patterns uh, uh, tra uh, supplanted or trans or, uh, uh, the, uh, the the geometric designs replaced that's the word I'm looking for replaced the geometric designs and so we have a sequence here I'm sure someone who knows beadwork well could just look at the garment look at the idea and tell what period it comes from uh, it also represents something of an ideological shift from uh, accommodating or dealing with, let's say, uh, trade uh, and how the technology then responds to uh, different ideas of what patterns to use. Quill work, beadwork. This is a um, set of images that uh, just illustrate more of the type of garments. Uh, this is a this is a quiver uh, with the extensive beadwork, I think, in this case, uh, on the quiver. Uh, this is a woman's hat. We saw one of those before, uh, decorated with the fringes on it. And here's a set of mittens that uh, appear to have the quill work, that geometric quill work. I don't know. This is from Osgood's book. Um, harder to make gloves, but gloves were known as well. And here's a foot, uh, a, a um, boot, bottom of the boot shows the beadwork design. I ha I'm, I'm got to be thinking this is for potlatches and other ceremonies. This is dress-up gear. Uh, doesn't seem to be all that functional for working out in the woods, but I don't know. Here's a pouch that uh, various things would be carried in. Um, and this is a drawing of by Elliot again. We encountered him earlier, 1906 where this Geshka, this, this uh, caption says a Kanaitsi chief, Cook Inlet. So here that pouch is shown and it's probably something like this. This isn't quite as elaborate as this one, uh, but uh, you know, that's maybe the failure of the draw, the artist rather than the anything else. So some of the other things you'd see uh, in um, of Denina clothing. Uh, men would typically wear this belt as well. This this dates from historic times, so this is, has to do with uh, shot and powder and all of that, but various things would be carried in these um, these things around the, this belt. And we've encountered this before. This is a woman's drinking tube during uh, menstruation and during the puberty ceremony for the young girls. This was one of the taboos, and so you would see women wearing that around their neck during menses. And uh, another thing you would see in the community, okay, I gotta pause this and answer the phone, I'm sorry. Okay, the phone rang and I forgot where I was, but uh, so here's a here's a one, something you would see worn around Denina villages in pre-contact times. So this is a dentalium um, necklace that uh, the Geshka would have worn. So this isn't something everybody would wear. This is this is for the Geshka and, and recognition of his or her status. So the white beads here are dentalium shell and the uh, others I think are just regular trade beads. This is hangs in the visitor center in Kenai. Uh, I believe the um, Alaska Native Heritage Center has one as well. I think there's one in Homer. Uh, and there's, I don't know, maybe six or seven that are known, but they're very, very indicative of very high status. Children uh, or infants, uh, I don't have any pictures, but there are, uh, some of these are, uh, have, are in the Denina or the Arctic Studies display at the museum in Anchorage. So infants were carried in moss lined or uh, bags of seal or caribou skin and sort of worn like a backpack by the mother. There also was a frame backpack that uh, infants would be put into. Diapers were moss, so that sphagnum moss that you've seen in the woods perhaps. Um, that's the that's the pampers of the time and of course you just just 
threw it out, threw it out, and uh, put in new moss when you needed it. Children were dressed just uh, generally like the women, uh, but often went shoeless in the summer, toughened up their feet. Um, I know my kids always seem to go shoeless in the summer. I don't know how they did it, but uh, I probably did too. Waterproof gear is important. We're northern people and we're coastal people for the most part, and so we need to have waterproof gear. So an, an anorak was made from intestines of brown bear or beluga. Now you might think there's a yuck factor here, something made of intestines, but I have seen these very pliable, very beautifully made, no smell, no nothing, just uh, and and highly waterproof, lighter than your Gore-Tex garment, lighter than your Heli Hansen, and just as waterproof. A spray skirt was made for the Bicudini. We saw a picture of that earlier, and that idea was, of course, borrowed from the Alutig. Uh, Water-resistant wading boots were made of bare skin, tanned without the hair, and greased from the top of a pot of boiling porcupine so the porcupine grease would be the waterproofing or water resistant agent that doesn't make the boots waterproof same thing that we talked about you don't want to on a regular basis you don't want to have um, boots that don't breathe because of the fear of um, trench foot but occasionally you do want waterproof, totally waterproof wading boots, and those were made from sea lion esophagus with soles of walrus, and this would have been traded in from Yupik or Alutic territory. So same thing, these were uh, the esophagus, the windpipe, um, was processed in such a way that it was both waterproof, but uh, was uh, was very pliable and and easy to use. Waterproof gear. Uh, sleeping robes and bags. I don't have any images of these, but robes were made of ground squirrel. We said to take 20 skins to make a, a robe or marten or lynx or sea otter or beaver. The rich had beaver skins and uh, these would have been uh, used in the Nichils here. We'll make some robes here that would have been in the sleeping areas. Uh, so uh, deliciously warm, I think. Uh, spread on top of spruce boughs. Um, when I go winter camping, I spread spruce boughs down and I put my thermarest on top and then a sleeping bag, but this would have been something similar. Sleeping bags for traveling were made of sheepskin with the wool inside, also made of caribou. And I just have this image of a wool sleeping bag. Heavy, yes, but man, that must have been wonderfully warm. Basketry. So these are baskets that are made by Helen Dick of Lyme Village. Uh, here Elizabeth is modeling these baskets, beautifully made baskets. And this would have been one of the high art forms of Denina people. There were also baskets made of spruce root or woven birch bark and grass mats. But uh, this basketry um, is just of, a, of the highest order and uh, quite remarkable. Waterproof, of course, would hold water, could be used for a lot of different things. I showed you, remember, the basket that was used for um, uh, stone boiling. And, uh, and, and when we talked about the riverine culture, and these would be just general purpose baskets. Here's how to sew a waterproof seam with birch bark. This is an illustration from Osgood. Uh, very cleverly illustrated, I have to say. Fold it over birch bark and it shows the sewing pattern. Some of you might be looking for a project to do for this class and this would be a good one. Let's see if you can figure out how to do a waterproof seam. This would be spruce root undoubtedly here. Possibly sinew, I don't really know. You'd have to research that, but this is the birch bark up here. These are bowls. Uh, most of these are in the Peabody Museum in uh, Yale, at Yale University. Uh, the coloring is kind of faded, but it's either that uh, 
uh, chalk rock or uh, clay, red claystone or alder. I kind of think it might be alder, but I don't know. Bentwood, uh, bowls, uh, beautifully done. Here's the image in the bottom of this, of this bowl here, the smaller bowl. Here are some of the baskets, uh, spruce root or wo woven birch fiber. I don't know enough truth to tell about baskets to know which is which here. Uh, this one's in the birch, in the Peabody Museum, and this is illustrated in Osgood. Has a similar um, geometric design pattern as the uh, quill work does. Lines. Uh, I know I've seen illustrations of lines, but I, I couldn't find them. They're from Captain Cook and Captain Vancouver's voyage. So they had a lot of different lines. Uh, speaking of those voyages, uh, Captain Cook in particular was very impressed with the Denina lines. And you would if you were a mariner, uh, one of the world's great mariners. He was impressed with the number of ropes and lines they had. So one was spruce root, a uh, single strand or twined, uh, peeled, uh, long, thin, would have been similar to a tough cord that we would use today. Sinew was used, uh, the back strap of a, or a caribou leg or a beluga tail ligament, and that sinew is, is fine and parted. It can be also twined, apparently. Uh, long, you could make long, long cords, heavy, stout, um, cords out of that. Babiche is a single strip of skin cut from a beluga or a brown bear. So I don't know exactly how thick a beluga skin is, but it's at least a half inch thick. And you could cut a single line of a, a beluga. See if I can, here's, here's a beluga here. So you would start your cut all the way around and get a line that is, I don't know how long it'd be. It seems to me it would be many, many yards long. And one single cut. Babiche. Rawhide is unprocessed, of course. Uh, and they also had kelp lines. Kelp uh, coming primarily from probably Kachemak Bay and other bays uh, and that made into lines. I wish I could find my illustrations of these, but uh, as I say, Cook was very impressed with them. This knife is obviously historic. It's in the Peabody Museum, and I don't know why I put it in here. Other than I just thought it was pretty cool. So this was a early uh, 20th century or maybe late uh, 1800s knife that Denina would have made, adapting steel technology to their system. And uh, I think this is the last slide, how to start fire. So this illustration is in Osgood, and he's got a written demonstration of it. So you have this plank on the bottom and plank on the top, and this twirls here, and your tinder goes down in this area. And typically you'd have two men, one on either side, one pulling this way, the other pulling the other way, spinning this creating friction, creating heat, and creating smoke. And where there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, I've seen it demonstrated. I've seen it done. And uh, it works. It, you have to know what you're doing. Another good project for someone if they wanted to figure out how, to, how this works. Uh, in some cases, it said that uh, people could twirl this between their hands and spin it hard enough. Uh, people who have tried it say it's virtually impossible to do because our hands aren't tough enough to make fire this way. So typically you'd have two people, uh, one to pull on this end, one to pull on this end, spinning that little dowel or dowel-like thing in order to um, make fire. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the interruptions. But that's technology, uh, and it's just the surface of technology. We, you know, they need to do. Uh, I'll put that on because while I'm jabbering away here, uh, there's much more. But it gives you an idea of the kind of uh, skill and the kind of adaptation and the kind of setting that uh, would have been uh, present mostly in pre-contact times. As trade goods came in, uh, of course, things gradually changed. 
Uh, knives were certainly treasured. Beads were highly treasured as well. Sometimes cloth, uh, although the last to go was the footgear, the footgear would hang hung in there till well into the 1900s. And uh, of course some of the others eventually gave way to items of Western technology. But what you saw here for the most part was, was what you could make from the Cook Inlet, Quijac drainage uh, environment. So thank you.